6 and verse 38 that we stand in honor of God's word. I know that's a little difficult sometimes, but it's worth it. And then sometimes I like to just remind, when you read the Old Testament, if you've ever read about how Moses, you know, uh, and the word of God was read, I think it says that he sat down and they stood for all that time, half a day. Think well, they read all read all the books of the law, but guess what they had after that? Revival. Yeah. Okay. Luke chapter six and verse thirty-eight. The Bible tells us, "Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all." it shall be measured to you again. Let's pray. Lord God, as we open your word today, I pray that you can help us, Lord, in these days, in these last days, to keep in mind what is most important, especially during this season of the year, especially when the world, Lord, has their own views of what giving and receiving is all about. Lord, in a sense, it's no different than those on Mars Hill that worshiped all the other gods, those things that appealed to the flesh. And Paul was sent there, Lord, with a message of hope, with a message of the gospel, just as we are sent into the world, especially in these last days, with the same message of the gospel. I pray, Lord, that we don't judge and that we don't look down on others, but, Lord, that we see the direct and the real need and that we give as you have enabled us as your church, Lord, as your bride, to give to them of that water of life freely, as you said, of the, of the way, Lord, in the master's path, Lord, of following you. The, Lord, the way of peace, the way of hope, the way of true joy. And I pray, Lord God, as we do this, you would enable us with your spirit to love our neighbor as ourself and to express that love in sharing the gospel. This is our prayer and our plea today, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, that's kind of the theme of what I wanted to say today, the Thanksgiving season. Well, then what do I mean by that? Notice the wording of the passage that we were reading. Luke chapter 6 and verse 32. The first part of this is about the worldly way of giving. But it tells us something here. For verse 32, for if you love them which love you, what thank have you? Now that's where I get that word, the thank kind of giving. We gave thanks during Thanksgiving, right, for all the blessings that God gave to us. We singled that day out as a day that this nation uh, uh, offers thanksgiving to God. Now, God's children offer thanksgiving always. The Bible teaches us when we come into his presence, we come into his house with thanksgiving. We enter his presence with thanksgiving. And by the way, if you're having a rough day or a rough time, or your life is kind of bumpy right now, and you just want some of that joy, that's the, the place to begin is with thanksgiving. By recounting those blessings that God has given to you, you begin to realize that God has poured out on you so many blessings. As, he's, as we've described right there about him giving, he's talking about this giving God, <coughs> excuse me, God is pouring into your life so many blessings. He has given you family and friends and kept you healthy this time. And even the challenges that you've gone through, God has taught you something. God has promised good in all of that that happens. Not that everything happens that is good, but all of it is promised for our good. And so even in that, we can thank the Lord for everything. As we thank him for that, we, we recount all these blessings. And next thing you know, we realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm praising God here because really he has done so much for me I cannot help but praise him for all that he has done and is doing. And that praise then moves us into worship, where we have realized, you know what, I have never been out of his care, and I am, I am never out of his presence. And how can I not be happy in his presence? And God, you have given so much to me, and you are faithful, and you are still looking out for me, and you are meeting all of my needs according to your riches and glory. God, what do you want me to do? And then you enter into worship where you really are ready to hear what God has on his heart. 
He's already heard what is on your heart. You have recounted what his word says to you, and now you're ready to hear from the heart what God has to say. I want us to enter into worship today and hear what is on God's heart. This, if you have a red-letter version of the Bible, is red letter. These are the words of Jesus speaking. The first part that he addresses here is about how the world gives. And I want us to notice that because in this day and age, you've seen all kinds of things. There have been some disturbing things, but the atheists that are doing some of these things and those godless uh, um, uh, foundations and organizations around this globe that are, that are pushing this, they're becoming much more bold in, in their anger and their, and their uh, dismissing of God. And uh, I know you've heard of some of those things. And, um, well... Recently, uh, um, we've seen on the news uh, of the atheists that have put this billboard up. And let me just recount for you, because this is really a kind of a quote from them, and there's a lot more other quotes. I want to give you a few of those from the worldly way of looking at things. You may, you may have seen this, but it says, Who needs Christ during Christmas? And that's how it comes out. And then a line comes across the screen and crosses out Christ, and it says, Nobody. But what is it? And then it goes on to say the true meaning of Xmas or celebrate the true meaning of Christmas without Christ. And they say, what is that meaning? And listen to the things how they, the world, the atheists describe this Christmas season. They begin with charity. Yes, it's possible for the world to have charity on someone else and still not be Christ motivated. Still not be Christ-centered. You don't need Christ for the things I'm about to describe for you here. Family, friends, food. This is what they say Christmas without Christ is really all about. Decorations. Everybody loves decorations. Is there anything wrong with decoration? Stockings hanging by a, a, a fireplace, you know, gifts, lights, fun, Chinese food. I wouldn't have put that on the list, but they put it there, so I'm telling you. Chinese food. Okay, how that got there. Hot chocolate. I can understand that one hot chocolate you know this is what they're saying Christmas is all about the Rockettes okay well, I, I think I know what those are <laughs> music parties snow and of course you know that movies on that day you could like what I go into movies a lot of people like go to movies on Christmas you know that's what they believe Christmas is really all about now is there anything wrong with those things inherently well probably not except if you put them in place of Christ. And so they have taken Christ out of Christmas, but they're not the only ones. Let me read you just a few quotes. These are some famous quotes by some famous people. You may have read their works before. Here's one, and I didn't know this guy's work too, too well, but it says this. The only gift I have to give is the ability to receive. If giving is a gift, and it surely is, then my gift to you is to allow you to give to me. Now, uh, yes, okay. Jared Kintz. Yeah, good. I'm glad you haven't heard of him, okay? But that's the attitude of the world, isn't it? You know, if it feels good, do it, you know? If it feels good, do it to me too. That, that's their attitude. They're out for whatever they can get, it seems like. Here's another one. As we work to create light, for others, sounds good so far, right? We naturally light our own way. Well, that's the humanistic view, Marianne Radmacher. Here's another one. Speak the truth. Do not become angered. And give when asked, even if it be a little. By these three conditions, one goes to the presence of the God. You know who said that? Buddha. You start to wonder, wait a minute, is this, is the line between what we have been doing for Christmas and what we think Christmas is about, is it getting gray? Is it broad? Is it, is, is it cut and dry like we thought it was? Or, or is it all mixed together? Here's another one. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want. But confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Truman Capote. Okay. 
Now, have you ever said anything that sounded kind of like that? You know, because somebody is going to give you something. Oh, great. We're going to have to give them something, too. I, I thought it was interesting. We had a, a note come through on Facebook about what we're not, our families are not going to be able to get together this, this year uh, with uh, Alicia's um, uh, in-laws. And so she was saying, you know what, it's really not about the gifts. I thought that was pretty nice to say. It's about family and friends, even though we're not going to be able to be together. But still, not one but the other, the family and friends, that was on the list of the atheist list. Family, friends, you know, parties, charity, giving, food. We need to think a little deeper. Here's one. The good part of Christmas is not always Christian. Uh, Robert Ingersoll. Now, he's a well-known, or I say among their circles, a well-known atheist. The good part about Christmas is not always Christian. You see, there, there is such an effort to remove God from, from Christmas. And that's why so many, well, our, na our, our state, along with several others now, has passed that law. It had to be passed as a law for it's okay for a, a city worker or, or a public official to be able to say Merry Christmas and not just Happy Holidays. Like so many uh, stores are making you say Happy Holidays. They leave Christ Christmas out. You know, that's, that's almost Grinch-like to try and do away with Christmas. Yet, even that story is questionable about its motives. Well, I'm talking about the story of the Grinch. <laughs> so, you that have children or like children's cartoons will, might watch that. Look forward to it. Set your DVR and all. Um, here's one last one. No one is useless in the world who lightens the burdens of another. That was written by Charles Dickens, the same one who wrote A Christmas Carol, the same person that growing up had experienced the poverty of what he describes in the story. His father even had spent time in debtor's prison, and their family did without, and he loved writing so much he would come home from school and spend three hours of writing. He just loved it so much right after that. And he himself, it's the, uh, the, the um, uh, internet says that he, uh, uh, at age 12, was given the task of taking the treasures of his family and, and to uh, pawn shops to get money to pay their debts. And some of those were books that they treasured greatly. In that day and age, those were, were very uh, loved items and something he loved himself. But his story never truly embraces Christ. He himself never really embraced Christ. He embraced the humanity side of Christ. He loved the thought of Jesus giving to the poor and sticking it to the rich, you know, and stuff like that. He, he loved that thought, but he, was, he never was a committed Christian, even in all of that story. Even when he wrote a book about the life of his Lord that, that was not given to publication, but only for his children so they could know about the life of Christ, even in that he was not committed to Christ. It's sad, but that's the way the world has gone as well. They love these stories. They admire these writers, and, and they uh, repeat their sayings and those things like that, and they adopt it for themselves, and they have turned giving and Christmas into exactly what the Lord describes here. Look at your text again, verse 32. For if you love them which love you, what thank have you? For sinners also love those that love them. Is it only about loving someone else? I think it was Mother Teresa that said something like that. About, about it's not what you give, it's how much you love when you give. The world loves, and they love those that love themselves. And, and, the, and the Bible even talks about places where they, they go around approving each other and, 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 and giving a, 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 um, glory to one another for the things that each does. That's a worldly thing. But what makes that different from what Christians do? Verse 33, and if you do good to them which do good unto you, what thank have you for that? For sinners also do the same thing. It's not just about being good. You see, the world kind of equates giving with goodness. And so by giving this one time of the year, even though all the rest of the year they were taking, and they're still concerned about taking, if you read that one guy's thing about my gift to you is that I will take whatever you give to me. Um, 
they still don't have it right. But they think that one little part where they get emotional and tender about giving, and they might give a little bit to someone else of, of what they can afford or, or, you know, out of their abundance that they've really done something, like they've earned some goodness. And behind all of that kind of thinking is still the same old thinking that I need to earn my salvation. What Christ has done for us on the cross, him coming to be born of a virgin, he laid aside his glory, as the song said. You know, in his, his glory was veiled in the flesh when he was in the flesh. So that we didn't see his glory, he came as a lowly child. But he died on the cross bearing all of our sins. That was the true giving. Look at the next verse. He says, if you lend to them whom you hope to receive, what thank have you for that? What is it? What good is it going to do you if you do only exactly what the world still does? For sinners also do even the same. For sinners also lend to sinners. For sinners also love each other. That's not good enough, in other words. That kind of giving is not good enough. There has to be more. And it's only more available to you through Christ. Through Christ. Verse 35. But love your enemies. Yeah, love your enemies. Okay, I, I want to tell you that as I read this, and if you read more of this chapter, you'll see it's going to smack you around a bit as Christians. It's going to make you sit down. It's going to make you really think about what Christ really was like. Do I want to be like that? Am I being like that? Do I love my enemies? Now, these are true enemies, okay? These are the ones that hate you. These are the ones that want to see you destroyed. But he says, love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. Now, I don't say do it for the reward, but God is saying, I am going to reward you. That's of his volition to give you a reward for what you do. He wants you to live for him. The bigger part to me is the next statement because God, it's up to him to give a reward. And I'm glad he does. And he's promised that to us and we can hope for that. But notice the next part. And you shall be the children of the heart. You see, when you love your enemies, you're not, you're not doling out that love based on merit. Do they deserve to be loved or not? Because he says, what, what your father is like, in order to be his children, you must be like your father. He says, what your father is like is, notice he says, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He's still kind. Why? Why? We say that saying, and we, we could ask that question, and the Lord does answer it, and we still wonder why. But he says, because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. By coming to repentance, we can be given the gift that cost him his life on the, on the cross, where he willfully laid it down in order to purchase for us that gift of eternal life, that promise of eternal life. It only comes through a right relationship with him, repentance, but that the world would come to repentance. He doesn't want them to die. That ought to be the reason for you as well when you're giving. You know, sometimes a gift can open a door that, that only God's love can heal what's going on behind that door. But that gift can be the opening. That's the difference for what this is. You see, in every one of the examples of the giving that is worldly is that expectation what I'm going to get for it. And even from this uh, uh, verse uh, 38, it has been twisted and it's been turned around so that even some people, some Christians have been deceived into thinking that's what I'm giving for so that more can be given to me. I'm not giving to receive. I'm giving so that Christ can be per portrayed in my life as giving to them. Let me read you another passage of scripture. It's a real short verse. It's in Matthew 10, 8. It's right when the Lord was sending out his disciples, just as we have been sent out. It says this, Matthew 10, 8. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received. Freely give. 
You see, the giving is about what only God can give. Were the sick being healed? Yes. But you know what? The Bible tells us also that these things are meant for you as the believers to understand. But for the world, for those without Christ, they're only given as parables. When they hear these things like this, they think only about the healing of the physical body. But in the healing of the lepers, what was leprosy? It was a disease that represented sin because there was no cure on this earth for that disease and still is not today. They can, they can hold it in remission, but they cannot cure leprosy today. It still represents sin. And he's saying, heal that. How can that be healed? Only by the healing that comes from Christ. That was one of the marks of the prophecy about him. How they knew that this was the Messiah. The deaf would hear. The blind would see. The lame would walk. All of those represent spiritual conditions. Or those that are dull of hearing. You cannot hear. You have ears to hear, but you don't hear. You have eyes to see, but you still don't see. And you're unable to come to me. If I didn't come all the way to you, we're unable to come to him. You see, all of those things and those miracles and even what he's describing here are spiritual truths. And he has given that to believers to bring this message of the gospel of Jesus, uh, of Christmas, and of the cross, and of the coming again, and of Easter to the world. We've said before when we look at the, at the times that were appointed through the, through the feasts that the gospel message that was given on Pentecost is the fulfillment of the first three feasts of his death, of his burial, of his resurrection. And that's really the message of the gospel, the essence of it, that he died on the cross and that he was buried, that he truly paid for our sins and he separated them from us and that he rose again as proof that what he has offered to us is a free gift. So now let's talk about some real giving. The Bible describes real giving in a simple verse. I know you know it. John 3, 16. Let me just quote it for you. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. Now he is our example. We are to give as we have freely received. What have you been given? that's worth giving away to the world. You can tell about your experiences, but if somebody can't relate to your experience, it does them no good. No, no more good than standing next to the person that won the lottery. You can get all excited with them, but you're not going home with anything. You see what I'm saying? No, but what you have been given, you can give away. As you have freely received, you can give. You can tell them about Christ. But Jesus said, he so loved. That he gave. Now, I think the so loved in there is because of the price of the, the worth of the gift that he gave. I mean, the worth of the gift is his own only begotten son. That's why it is so loved. It's not just loved, it is so loved. When you love, do you give until it costs you? He said he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the gift, you could say, that keeps on giving. That is the gift, only one worth having. Until you have that gift, you don't have anything. And the Bible tells us that's true. Well, looking back at our text again, he said, uh, Luke 6 and uh, 35, love your enemies. Do good and land hoping for nothing again. For your reward shall be great when you do these. The reward is that you are the children of God. He has made you his children. And you live up to that character. You live up to that family name when you give in this kind of a way. When you give the only gift worth having. And he has entrusted that gift to you. I think it's interesting. There's a parable and I want to kind of close with this. There's a parable in Matthew 25, 14. And he says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. And I think about that. Okay, a parable has a spiritual significance. A spiritual truth behind it. The spiritual truth, I think, that I see here is the kingdom of God is like the son of God who having established his kingdom, a kingdom here on this earth with, with his body, with his church, has now gone away to a far place to prepare a place for us. 
And in his absence, what did he, this man do in the parable? For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, and Jesus calls us to himself, and he delivers unto them his goods, and he delivered unto us his goods. And now he's gone to prepare a place for us, and he's going to be coming again just as this story tells us. But now that he's gone, he's left us with talents. He's given us things to use. In this example, in this parable, those talents are fleshly things, money, uh, possessions, things like that. And that's what they represent. These are by what the Bible refers to as the little things. You have been faithful in the little things. Oh, but so too many times we as even Christians make too big of a deal of these little things and neglect the greater things. I'm saying at this time of the year we need to focus on those greater things. Because as we take and use those talents that God has given to us. When he returns, he's going to tell us what it says in, in Matthew 25 and 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, for thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And then is the promise fulfilled of what I said at the very beginning, the secret to true joy. <laughs> I didn't forget about that. What is the secret to true joy? I think I even put it in your bulletin. The secret to true joy. Here it is. Here it is. He says, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. It only comes through faithful giving out, doing of what God has entrusted in your possession, in your person to do for him. You are a servant. He has enabled you as a servant. Everything you have that's worth anything, he gave to you. Just like the sower of the seed. What he gave he is, the, is that word, is that seed. And, and, and he had to be given that word to give out. God has given us this to give out. Then he also said the same thing in verse 23 to the one who had given the two talents. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And you know what? Then he ends this story with the, with the description of what this giving was like. Remember they said, well, when did we do these things for you? And he says, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. So even our service, even loving our neighbor, even delivering this message, even helping them with the things that are needful for the body is service to the Lord. So I guess I can ask this question. Are you truly giving to the Lord today? Are you truly giving with your life of what is really worth giving, of that which God has given to you? And so in this message, really, I want to encourage you to be givers because for the Christian, it's not just a day. It's not just a season. It's every day, every season for the Christian to be giving. And we can truly give. And yes, even to those who put up billboards like that, they don't know what they're missing out. We need to tell them. We need to so I guess it is appropriate that the fence still says, go tell it. Amen? So that becomes a Christmas message. Go and tell the good news. Isn't that what the shepherds went and did? Isn't that what the angels came to do? Aren't we to go and do the same thing and then prove that we are the children of God? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message today. I'm encouraged, Lord. Though you've shown me that I'm not always in the right attitude. Though you show me that sometimes I stop short of giving the greatest that you've enabled me to give. Forgive me for that, Lord. And I thank you that your grace upon me has enabled me to be able to give. 
be able to tell others about you. And just as I have come to know you, others can come to know you as well. That's truly what this Christmas ought to be about. The greatest gift that you gave to this world, that of your only begotten Son. And that we, believing in you, can have that promise, that wonderful gift of everlasting life. A life forever with you when we enter into the joy of you. Thank you for these things. Empower me, Lord, to be the servant that I need to be, faithful in serving you, faithful in carrying out your orders, that I might be found faithful when you return. Lord, we do look forward to that return as we sang in that song. We, Lord, when we see you there, and the gates are open, we can rejoice when we enter into your presence, Lord. Oh, it's just going to be so wonderful. But in the meantime, we have been given this joy of being able to give. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for each one that's here today and whoever will be listening to this message. We give you the honor, the glory, the praise and worship for all that you have. Jesus' name.